Okay, everybody. I, uh, I've been stuck with these chair duties, but uh, it's a great uh, pleasure, great honor to have here with us uh, Javier Bianchi from the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis and uh, expert in uh, international macro and uh, uh, graduated at the University of Maryland and from uh, the University of Montevideo. Uh, Xavier, 40, 45 minutes, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here um, in you know, Pretoria, my, my first time here in South Africa, and pleasure to be in this conference focused on, on emerging markets, uh, coming from Uruguay, the questions and policy challenges of emerging markets have always been very close to my heart, so it's, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about some of my work here. This is going to be a uh, joint work with, with Guido Lorenzoni. And this is based on a, on a paper that we prepare for the Handbook of International Economics. Um, this is the clicker. OK. So emerging markets right now are in a fairly you know, unique situation with the global tightening of monetary policy the ongoing reversal of, of financial conditions. But you know, at some level, uh, policymakers in emerging markets have been dealing with macro and financial market instability for, for a long time. And uh, however, what is, what is a bit different now is that you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, there has been big changes in the way we think about how uh, emerging markets should respond to you know, different phases in, in, the, in the global financial cycle. And in particular, policies like capital controls, uh, foreign currency reserves, or capital flow management are now part of the well-accepted uh, policy toolbox. Much of the focus on this literature has been on the, on the prudential scope for these policies in the sense of uh, interventions that are designed ex ante to try to improve outcomes when a shock hits exposed. So what we do in this, uh, in this handbook chapter is, is we develop a, a simple model to try to uh, you know, revisit some of the, of the literature through the lens of a, of a unified uh, framework. And we try to also shed some new light on, on, on some of these topics. So I'm going to talk about today uh, some of these Themes here. There's a lot more in the in the chapter that I won't be able to cover in detail. Um, so basically, at the core of our model is going to be a, a monetary policy dilemma by which the central bank is going to face some tensions between output stabilization and exchange rate stabilization. I'm then going to show you how capital controls, ex ante or ex post, can help improve the policy menus. For, for the central bank. Okay. You know, to think about really capital controls from a welfare point of view, we need to think about what are the underlying externalities going on in, in financial markets. So I will talk about uh, pecuniary externalities and aggregate demand externalities. Uh, but for today, I'm going to focus mostly on, on aggregate demand externalities. I'm also going to talk about how foreign intermediaries or basically having a, an upward supply of funds from, from abroad is going to shape some of the policy implications. Then I will also talk about foreign currency reserves. And, and there was a paper yesterday on, on this topic. Uh, we're going to argue that through the lens of this model, thinking about exchange rate management and, and thinking about precautionary motives are actually two sides of the same coin. Uh, and finally, I will also uh, talk about a topic that has received relatively less attention in, in the literature, which has to do with uh, capital controls on outflows as a crisis management tool. So yesterday there was a presentation on Lebanon, and, and Refet suggested capital controls might help. Well, I, I'll, I'll actually talk about that, how they might, how they might actually help in, the, in, in that situation. Um, but uh, importantly, this is going to be about controls on outflows. Okay, uh, it's going to distinguish from some of the um, uh, prudential role that I'll, I'll be focusing on. And let me say, there's a lot more in the 
In the chapter, we review some of the stylus facts about how governments use these uh, capital controls and macro potential policies. Uh, there's some important work that Laura has done on, on that respect. And so we also cover um, what the literature says about the effectiveness of these policies. And, and there's, of course, a growing literature. And, um, but we, we try to uh, revisit some of that. OK, so let me now jump to the, to the model. Uh, it's going to be a small open economy with a tradable, non-tradable production structure. There's going to be incomplete financial markets. There's going to be downward rigid wages. There's going to be an upward supply of international funds. And there's going to be a cost of exchange rate fluctuations that I'm going to be referring to as a, I'm going to be referring to as a fear of floating cost. Okay? Um, you know, you can, this is going to be, um, let me, I'll show you in a, in a bit. And let me also say the framework that we develop here is related to some work uh, uh, at the IMF on the integrated policy framework. There are, of course, some, you know, uh, some differences, but there's some uh, similarities as well. That, uh... OK, so, uh, so these are the preferences of the household. So they are going to have this utility over consumption of tradables and non-tradables with a CES. Uh, structure for tradables, non-tradables. There's going to be uh, an endowment for tradables. And if you want to think also about the uh, a model where there's production of tradables and there's dollar currency pricing, that would actually be very similar. Okay? But for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the case where the tradable is simply an endowment. Uh, it could be a commodity that you, know, you, um, you can export or import. The loved one price is going to hold for, for, for tradables. And for simplicity, I just normalize the foreign price to 1. Output of non-tradables is going to be linear in, in employment. And the supply of hours is going to be fixed at n bar. Okay? So because there is going to be weight rigidities, households may, may not be working their full hours. Uh, they don't get any uh, utility from, from leisure for simplicity. This is the household's uh, budget constraint. They're going to have basically three types of assets that they, they, can, uh, they can hold or, or issue. There's going to be a position in pesos that's going to be AT, that, and the interest rate, nominal rate here, is going to be set by the central bank. There's going to be an asset position in dollars. That's going to be A star. And, and the interest rate on, the, on those assets, think about you know, US Treasury bills, is going to be exogenous. There's also going to be borrow in, in, in dollars at, uh, at an interest rate. So it should be I hat star that is going to be, is going to be endogenous. Okay? So this is the budget constraint here. You have basically the consumption expenditures. Uh, you have basically the, uh, the, the investments in the, uh, in the assets, the domestic assets, the foreign currency assets. These are the payments of, of debt. And here are the sources of income, the, uh, the tradable endowment, the labor income, and then the, the initial assets, domestic foreign currency. And this would be the uh, issuances of, of new bonds uh, in foreign capital markets. So in equilibrium, because this interest rate, OK, I hat here is going to be higher than I star, then households are always going to be in some corner. They either would have positive assets, foreign assets, or they might have uh, foreign currency debt, but they won't have positions, po uh, positive positions on both. And I'm going to focus on the case where the small open economy here is going to be a borrower. Okay, firms, they, they maximize their the static profits. Uh, as I said, per production is linear, which means that in equilibrium, the price ought to be equal to the, to the wage. And we're going to introduce downward weight rigidity following Schmieger-Hanuribe. Uh, so basically, employment 
is going to be uh, demand determined whenever uh, the market clearing wage is below uh, W bar, okay, which is going to be this uh, rigid wage. Okay? So in equilibrium, two things can happen. You could have full employment and the wage possibly being above this, this lower bar, or you could have basically the wage stuck at W bar, and then you have the employment uh, demand determined. So if I use household optimality, this would be combining uh, the, uh, this would be the first order condition with respect to tradable and non-tradable consumption. You get that relationship, and you use market clearing. What you end up is basically with uh, a function of employment that is going to be increasing in tradable consumption, and it's going to be uh, increasing in the, in the exchange rate. Okay, so once the, once the weight rigid is binded, you can see how increases in the exchange rate are going to help because they would uh, reduce the real wage and, and basically stimulate employment uh, by the firms. Okay? Or another way to think about it is that as you increase the exchange rate, that, that generates an expenditure switching that pushes up the demand for non-tradables and is going to help redu reduce uh, unemployment. You also see uh, employment increasing in consumption, and that's going to be a, a, key, a, a key relationship for, for, uh, to think about the policies. And the idea here is that if there's higher, uh, higher consumption, higher tradable consumption, then basically that's going to push up also the demand for non-tradable consumption, even a fixed uh, relative price, that pushes up the demand for non-tradable consumption, and that's going to push up uh, employment. Okay. okay, so then we have the uh, international investors. They are going to uh, face some costs from taking dollar positions in the country. They are going to be borrowing at the rate I star, which is this, uh, this, frictionless, this frictionless market and then they land at the rate of I hat star. Okay, so this is gonna be the problem that the intermediaries are gonna face. You can see it's static. What they do is they, they wanna uh, give loans equal to B hat star. Well, they need to get some deposits, and those deposits have a rate of I star. And then on top of that, they need to pay these uh, portfolio costs. Now, with a, with a quadratic, uh, function fee of this portfolio cost, then you basically get this uh, relationship that says that how much intermediaries are willing to lend in the small open economy is going to be uh, positively related to uh, the spread between the rate at which the intermediaries lend and the rate at which intermediaries borrow. Okay? And that could be, you know, many other. Um, micro foundations for, for this type of upward sloping uh, supply of funds, but this is the one we're, we're doing it. Okay, and, and the idea now is gonna be thinking about shocks, shocks to omega, shocks to this, this portfolio cost. So we wanna think about, for example, a capital flight. Uh, investors may become, may become nervous, they may think that, uh, you know, um, Peru or Chile may not be able to, uh, to pay back the debt, or they, they might just want to pull away from emerging markets. And so that's going to be uh, a decrease in Omega, which means that now uh, for the country to get the same amount of, of loans from abroad, they need to be willing to pay a higher spread. Okay. So this is going to be a, a, supply, a supply shift um, for, uh, for the loans. Now, this is the definition of equilibrium. Uh, it's fairly, um, fairly standard. So let me highlight here that we need to have market clearing for non-tradables. So this, they remember the two goods, the tradables and the non-tradables. The non-tradables has to clear domestically. And uh, domestic bonds also has to be clear domestically. 
And then we also have the market clearing for, for funds, OK? Whatever the uh, households want to demand, or in terms of, of loans from abroad, has to be equal to the, the amount that banks want to supply. OK, so uh, to, to be able to show you uh, how the model looks like in a, you know, almost in pencil and paper and graphically, I'm going to make a set of simplifying assumptions. I'm going to assume that the tradable endowment is constant. I'm going to assume the economy starts with, with no assets or liabilities at t minus 1. Then we're going to consider one shock only, and that's going to be a capital flight shock that's going to occur at time t. And then uh, I want to assume that for after the shock hits, at t plus 1, t plus 2, and so on, all prices are flexible. There is no, uh, basically, inelastic supply of funds. And so the model becomes uh, super, simply, super simple. And basically, you jump to the steady state after, after t plus 1. OK, so, so think about, you know, this is an infinite horizon, but they're going to be uh, basically three key dates, OK? T minus 1, that's when all the portfolio decisions are made. Uh, with uncertainty, because there could be a shock at, at, time, uh, at time t. So when the shock happens at time t, there's going to be a decision about monetary policy. And then at t plus 1, the economy is going to be at a steady state. So because uh, prices are flexible from t plus 1 onward, you know, I can assume pretty much anything about monetary policy. And to keep it... Uh, Simple, I'm going to assume that the exchange rate, the central bank would target an exchange rate of, of E bar. OK, now let me show you uh, what the demand for funds is. Uh, and, and here is where the, um, uh, the time t minus 1 decision for, for households. The households basically are going to be equating the the benefits from borrowing today and consuming tradables to the marginal cost of paying those funds, which is going to have an interest rate of five hat star, and you know the marginal utility from paying those funds tomorrow. On top of that, we have the country budget constraint for for tradables. Okay, and and remember that after t plus one, this becomes uh, just stationary. And so if I can, if I you know combine those two. Uh, conditions, and I further assume that sep preferences are separable, I can, I can show basically that the demand for funds is simply going to be a function of the, uh, how costly is to borrow, and then the initial position. Okay? And you know, here's an analytical expression for, uh, for the demand for funds at, at time t. So, um, this is this could be really any time. Yes, any t this could be really any t. Um, as long as as long as preferences are separable, um, I know basically that the that the demand for borrowing uh, will depend on. Uh, the interest rate, the real interest rate at which you, at which you borrow, it depends on the, on the initial position. And you can see here that it does not depend on, on the monetary policy at time t. And that's basically because of several preferences. So because of several preferences, uh, the marginal utility of tradables is independent of non-tradables. And so monetary policy is going to be affecting here in this economy non-tradables, but it does not have the power to affect tradables, and then it does not have the power to affect uh, borrowing. So graphically, this is how it looks. Um, so I have here the, the interest rate on the y-axis. I have lending on the, on the x-axis. So I told you before that the supply of funds is going to be this a linear function, OK? And the demand for borrowing is basically the, the expression I just showed you. 
So the intersection here is going to be the, the equilibrium that's going to give us the interest rate at which the small open economy is able to borrow and the amount of funds that come in. Now, what happens if there is a supply? Okay, now uh, investors, uh, they want to pull out of, of emerging markets and now for, uh, for any interest rate, now they are willing to lend less. Well, what happens, of course, is the equilibrium, the interest rate goes up and uh, the amount that the small open economy is going to borrow is going to be lower. Yeah. Now, what we want to think about is what is this going to imply for, for monetary policy decisions and other, other, uh, other policy decisions. Now, let me tell you that you can, um, at the end of the day, you can express this model in three equations. That's something that, that makes, it, makes it very tractable. You really, at the end, have these three equations and, and three unknowns that you can solve, basically, in a, in a block of recursive way. You first have the demand equal to the supply in the international loan market. That's going to give us the market clearing rate. Then you have a, a modified UIP condition that, that basically says that households are indifferent between borrowing in domestic currency and borrowing in foreign currency. So given an exchange rate tomorrow, that's going to give us what is the exchange rate today. So here you see the link between the nominal rate chosen by the central bank and, uh, and the exchange rate uh, in equilibrium. And then finally, going to the, to the real side, you also see that, that the employment, okay, or output, is going to be uh, related to uh, the exchange rate and to, uh, and to the demand. Okay? If you have more borrowing, that's going to raise output. And uh, if now suddenly the interest rate goes up, you are going to have lower demand and therefore lower employment as well. So now uh, let me do the, the policy analysis. So, so the idea now is to think about, well, this shock hits. This is a time, time T when, the, when this omega shock hits. The, the policymaker is going to inherit some initial position for, uh, for dollar borrowing. And now it's going, to, it's going to have to choose what is going to be the, the exchange rate and the nominal interest rate. Okay. And here we're going to assume that uh, the policymaker is going to have an objective that is going to be basically the lifetime utility of the households. But we're going to add also a cost from uh, deviations of the exchange rate relative to some target. Okay? One of, of course, extreme assumptions is if you have a fixed exchange rate, then uh, the central bank at all times is going to want to have ET equals to E bar. But you can think more generally about economies, maybe where there's some inflation targeting, and, they, and the central bank wants to avoid uh, you know, inflation costs. And to do that, it needs to control the exchange rate. Actually, if you're a true inflation target there, you don't care about this. Well, you care about inflation. No, no. Uh, you care about inflation, and, and the exchange rate is an instrument no. to control inflation. No. If you're a true inflation target there, you don't care about it, uh, the exchange rate. I mean, depends on what you mean you don't care. All I'm saying here is I want to have, have a setup where uh, in a way, there's no divine coincidence. So the idea is that monetary policy cannot achieve the efficient allocation. And, and the way we do that is by, by introducing this cost from uh, deviations from the exchange rate. You can also think about other micro foundations. For example, the paper that Lufu presented yesterday on, on fear of floating is another way to think about why, why the central. I don't want to stick with one interpretation about no, I, if you don't like inflation target. No, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Hmm. Do not care about the exchange rate. Hmm. Oh, in practice, you mean? Yeah, that's yeah. New Zealand, that, that was Brazil right now, where they're fighting inflation, they don't care about the exchange rate, they care about inflation. No, no, the point is well taken, I think. And, and it is true that if it devalues, you might get more inflation, but you don't, you don't, you don't No, no, I, I think there are you know, few pure uh, inflation, inflation targeters. Um, 
these days. So the, for many central banks, the exchange rate considerations are always part of the uh, of the policy of the policy objectives. And uh, I don't want. I'm not saying this is a a, a pure inflation targeting regime. But anyway, there could be other other micro foundations could have to do with balance sheet constraints or reputation. You know, you said you want to keep. Uh, uh, the currency at some levels, and then if you if you suddenly devalue, that might trigger uh, some reputational losses. So we're not going to take a particular stance on what is this this function. We're going to take that as given. Okay, so uh, so now I want to talk about the monetary policy dilemma. So this is an initial situation. Maybe you are uh, you are here at you know full employment. And uh, basically, let me describe now here the policy menu. You have employment on the x-axis, and you have the exchange rate on the y-axis. These are the these are the preferences. Okay, E bar is your desired target for the exchange rate. So as you have, if you have a an exchange rate that is above the target, this indifference curve becomes downward, uh, you know, upward sloping, and then it becomes downward sloping when the exchange rate falls below the target. These are the these are the preferences, and this is the policy. This is the policy menu. Okay, this is going to be uh, for given a choice of the exchange rate. What is the level of employment that the central bank is able to achieve? Okay, and this comes from this equation here. The higher the exchange rate, well, the higher the employment you can you can achieve up to the point in which you know households are supplying all their hours in the market. So uh, the idea is imagine a situation where, uh, given the supply of funds, you are able to achieve uh, you are able to achieve the this efficient allocation, where you you get full employment and you stabilize exchange rate at the desired level, but now suddenly there is a, a shock. There's a capital flight shock. That's going to end up generating an increase in the interest rate. It's going to reduce capital inflows. And it's going to shift this uh, policy menu up. Okay? Now it's, it's a more delicate situation for, for, the, for the policymakers because now for the same level of the exchange rate, it's going to, be able, it's going to have to have a recession. Okay? Now, uh, the, the central bank can still achieve the uh, full employment if we were willing to raise the exchange rate up to this level. But of course, that's, you know, that, that, that's costly. So uh, you know, in general, the policy maker is going to be at, a, at an interior solution where um, you let the exchange rate go a little bit, and then you, you face a, a recession. OK, uh, so the, the point is that the central bank in this situation is going to have a, a, a dilemma, which you know, there is some empirical evidence that that is part of the um, uh, discussions for, for central banks. And now I want to talk about how capital control can help to improve the policy menu. OK, so this is a bit of the timeline for, for policies. There is a time T. My, I just told you about the, the monetary policy dilemma here at time T. Now I'm going to talk about what, the, uh, what other policies the central bank could use, ex ante, by using capital controls or foreign currency interventions, or by using capital controls exposed. Uh, so, uh, so exposed. What, what, can the, what can the central bank do? Well, it's in a situation like this, right? Where you are facing, uh, where you're facing basically a recession and, and, and you know, your exchange rate is, is too, too depreciated. Well, one thing you can do here is try to stimulate more demand. How you could do that, you could subsidize, for example, borrowing. 
Okay, that would be that would be one way. That would be one way to uh, to help basically uh, deal with the, the recession. Now I'm going to argue that that's going to have some costs. And here you have the, the formal problem: how the uh, central bank is is choosing the policies. So basically, the way to think about it is that the the, the central bank is going to maximize. Uh, the welfare subject to a set of, uh, you know, implementability constraints. And it's going to be picking this tax, okay, this could be a subsidy, on borrowing to try to uh, ease the, the recession. And uh, the, the government is going to basically respect what the uh, output is going to be as a function of the exchange rate and, and consumption. And... Uh, that's what the formal problem looks like. It turns out we can start basically uh, getting rid of some of the constraints. The government's going to be picking the tax, so I can get rid of that equation. And then if you impose that the, the weight rigidity binds, then we're left with this problem here. OK? So this is the maximization subject to those, those three constraints. Now let me uh, move a bit forward and show you what the key optimality condition looks like for the, uh, for the central bank. Uh, so basically, the question now is whether there is any scope for doing the capital control exposed in the sense of this subsidy or, or, or tax on, 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 on foreign borrowing. And what I want to argue is that here it's uh, it's not, it's not so clear because there are going to be two forces going on at the same time. First of all, if you subsidize borrowing, that might be a good thing because you have a, you have a recession. So by pushing more demand, you are going to end up generating uh, more employment, and that's a good thing. That's this term here. But at the same time, remember that you're facing this upward sloping supply of funds, so if you subsidize borrowing, you're going to end up uh, paying higher interest rates. Okay? You have these foreign intermediaries that are, uh, are, owning a, are earning a spread on the, on the loans they give. So when you, when you subsidize the demand, that, that's going to make, make households worse off because every household would end up paying a higher interest rate. So that's like they're putting a tax on foreign barn, barn dollars. Uh, no, so it's the, let me let's uh, so uh, the, the this is how, this is where you are after the yeah. the foreigners pull out. And now what you can do is if you put a if you put a tax on foreign borrowing, what this is going to do is going to. Uh, It looks, yeah. Mind, I yeah. Don't care about that. It, but uh, what I'm confused about is that the government, the government subsidy could replace, the, in effect, the dash line with the solid line again. Uh, that's where I'm going. That's exactly where I'm going. So what the government could do is say, oh, look, I still want to keep the same cap amount of capital inflows. You cannot replicate exactly this, but what yeah. you can do is say, well, look, I have too little borrowing because these guys are pulling out. Yeah. But what I can do is, is, uh, is subsidize borrowing by domestic households. Yeah. What that does is basically, graphically, it's gonna, you're going to have to shift uh, the demand up, up to a point like here, where in that way, you, you're able to get the same amount of capital inflows still the same loss of, there's still a loss to the country because the foreign guys are getting more money. Exactly, exactly. And, and uh, but, okay, sorry, so this is what you're doing, you're talking. Yes, that's exactly, that's exactly, that's exactly the trade-off that appears in this, uh, in this condition. If you, if you subsidize borrowing, that's on one hand a good thing because it stimulates employment, but on the other hand, you're going to end up raising the rate that households pay on their debt, and that, that's of course a, that's of course society, a bad thing. Right? I mean, the households privately are getting subsidized. 
Yeah. But then they're getting a tax. Uh, if you lump, you lump some tax to some city. Yeah, yeah. So then, the, then they're, they're getting taxed in lump sum form. So privately, it looks like they're getting cheap. They're getting the. Yeah. The uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for thanks for clarifying that. Yes, uh, you might say, "Oh, there's a subsidy. That's great." But no, because at the end of the day, yeah, you're gonna be paying for that with taxes. Okay. So that's exactly right. And then it, and then in equilibrium, we all end up uh, borrowing at a higher rate because these these foreign intermediaries, as you walk in the upward supply schedule, they, they need a higher rate to be willing to lend. Um, that's exactly right. OK, so now, given that capital controls exposed, or this form of capital control exposed can not do much, uh, let's think about uh, ex ante, ex -ante so policies. So can you repeat the capital controls? What, what are they doing? It's a, the capital control, the way it's modeled, is a subsidy on, could be a su subsidy or a tax oh, on a subsidy or tax on foreign borrowing, yeah, yeah. and that's the that's, that's a cap capital. that's the capital control. Okay. I thought capital control was like you know you're not allowed to buy this asset or that asset or something like, or transfer. Yeah, because no. that can't that won't that can't be done. Yeah, nothing like that. If you're trying to get a capital inflow. In this case, when you're in a recession, you're at time T. You wanna you need more capital inflows. Yeah, and so you, you need. I will, I will talk about a, a different form of capital control later on that would help. Uh, for, for this part, I'll talk about really like a tax or a subsidy on, on foreign borrowing and, and how, you, how doing that you can reallocate demand intertemporally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so now it's a time T minus one. That's before the shock hits. So this is going to be getting good times. So let's see what the government can do uh, to, to try to ameliorate the problems at time t. And so to see this, this graphically, basically remember that that's the situation that uh, the central bank could be facing at time, at time t. That's the, you know, this is the policy menu that the central bank will have to choose. So now think about what would happen if households start at time t, okay, when the shock hits, with a higher uh, net foreign asset position. What if they had borrowed less in t minus one? If they had borrowed less in t minus one, then they would need less borrowing in a, in period t. They will have the, you know they will have a higher position, so that's going to uh, move this policy menu to the right. Now the, the the central bank instead of having to choose within this red line is going to be able to choose within this green line, which is better because it moves you closer to the efficient allocation. So that's going to be the key idea how capital controls ex ante is going to help. They're going to improve the policy menu that that the central bank is going to be facing after the shock hits. But the idea is that households are not internalizing this. When they think about borrowing or saving, uh, they think about their private cost and benefit. What the tax on borrowing at t minus 1 is going to do is going to induce agents to internalize uh, the externality. So formally, this is, the, this is what the, the problem um, is going to look like. Now I, I'm, you know, I'm putting this tax at, at t minus 1. And uh, you, know, you can uh, show formally how, if you solve this problem, you end up basically with, with the following now. This is, again, the first order condition for, for the central bank. Uh, and now you can see that the, <laughs> these two wedges that appear before are going to be both on the right hand side. Okay? Now at t minus 1, if you uh, put a tax now on borrowing, now again, well, you might say <laughs> you put a tax on borrowing, that makes it more expensive. Yes, that's true for an individual household. But on the aggregate, 
by, by taxing borrowing, we're going to be reducing the profits that we ship out to the, to the foreign intermediaries. That's this red term. And now, in addition, you're going to have the, the aggregate demand externality because as, as households basically uh, save more, if all collectively were to save more or borrow less, that's going to imply that they will have more resources to consume in a recession. If households have more resources to consume in a recession, that's going to push up employment. So, and that's, going to, that's how it's going to help. Hmm. Or would it be a function of the aggregate asset position? I think you're, you're, you're assuming that it's a function of the aggregate asset uh, position of the country as a whole, so that you get the externality. OK. And this is about this, this first term, you mean? A star minus B star. Yeah, I'm not assuming that. That's a result. That's a result here, because the, there's a supply of funds that, yeah, yeah. that for the but I mean, you have an environment that has that implication. Yes, it has that feature, yes. That environment. And the, the, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. The, the, the debate, this more basic thing, which is when, when, a, when somebody wants to borrow dollars, uh, yeah. do they look at the balance sheet of the person doing the borrowing, or do they look at the balance sheet of the entire No, in, in this case, the, the bank, uh, think about here in South Africa, they look at the at the house, at the households, the household position. Now the problem is that there's only a limited amount of intermediaries that are willing that are willing to lend to to, to South Africa. So, uh, you know, if, if if everybody in South Africa borrows more, then these intermediaries are going to end up charging a higher interest rate. Yeah, but they could do it person by person. Yeah, it's it, it is person. Yeah. Their network. A function of their, yes. As opposed to the net worth of the aggregate. Yes. And then you wouldn't have the externality. Um, if, if you have uh, an infinite amount of intermediaries willing to lend in, the, in, the, in, 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 in South Africa, then everybody would be, will, would be able to borrow at a frictionless interest rate, this, you know, the same interest rate as the Treasury bill. But now, because there's only you know a limited amount of intermediaries that are willing to invest, um, then what's the overall demand in South Africa is going to affect the market clearing rate. So if everybody you know th that's the supply, that's the I'm back here, and that's that's the that shift in the demand of everybody here in in South Africa will end up affecting the. The interest rate, but every every individual agent basically does not internalize how its own borrowing decisions are going to be affecting this this overall demand curve. But I thought the question was a little bit was more practical. Like in the model, there is this. Yeah. No. Uh, Shabby, I think yeah. you, can, you can have this idea that foreigners don't like South Africa for some mm. reason. Yeah. But they will still make the interest rate a function of the net worth of the individual to whom they're lending. Yeah. Um, and then it'll be the then then it's simply that they're from South Africa. That'll be the little marker on them. And, and I don't think there's this. Then you won't have the externality. No, I, it, it is there as long as there's only a limited amount of banks. The, the the problem is there's only a limited amount of banks that are willing to lend. In, 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 in South Africa. So they imagine uh, they, they, there's this upward sloping curve, right? So they, this is how much they are, this is, this is the entire amount of funds that banks want to lend in South Africa. And so if everybody uh, borrows more, that's going to end up raising the interest rate. And um, so it's not. This whole debate. That, I yeah. Remember that's a, it was at the fund. We had a yeah. big discussion with a lot of people. 
Yes, you don't like South Africa. Now you put a bigger, you're a marker on South Africa. Yep. Now the question is, do you have a completely free-looking market, which is you just you just give an interest rate to South Africa that's a function of the aggregate net worth of South Africa, and mm. it's going to be a high one, mm. or do you uh, uh, actually uh, yeah. hit people yeah. depending on the individual's net worth that you lend to? You yeah. might give them a higher interest because they're South African. But it's still, there would be less of an extra. You know, your decision yesterday would have no impact on other people's ability to borrow. Let me see, I did not. You can do the borrowing firms. People, and in fact, these firms do get bigger. Yeah, that okay. Works. Yeah, let me. Uh, um, so the one, the one really. The, the externality that I want to focus more actually is on this on this aggregate demand externality, which is about which still operates even if you have a frictionless uh, capital market. Okay, so as long as you have a recession, could be triggered by a capital flight shock or could be triggered by by a commodity price shock. As long as you have a recession, as long as you have a recession. Putting more, 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 more foreign savings or, or less debt is going to have a positive demand externality. As agents have more resources to consume in a recession, that's going to help increase output. And the key is that each individual agent does not internalize these positive effects. And again, it's, that's completely independent of the other, of the other externality. So here's some, you know, some references. Uh, and let me uh, move now to the, the question on, on foreign currency interventions. And this is something that came up in a, in a paper yesterday. Uh, here you see the evolution of, of foreign currency reserves. And here I put here for the fixed exchange rate and for the flexible exchange rate. So in both cases, you see this significant increase in, in the holdings of, of reserves. It is uh, a bit more notorious for for the fixed exchange rate, but it's also, it also occurs for flexible exchange rates. Um, okay, so there are you know, two views out there about, or you know, maybe, maybe more than two, but at least there are two views about why countries should accumulate reserves. One has to do with this precautionary view, that you know, if you have more reserves, you have more resources to spend, in particular in a recession. And that's going to be a, a good thing. Uh, and at the same time, there's this other more of exchange with management view, is that if you, you want to prevent large fluctuations in the exchange rate, well, reserves are going to help you to achieve that. Now, through the lens of this model, these two uh, views turn out to be uh, two sides of the same coin. And uh, I'm showing here the, you know, the, the optimality conditions uh, for the amount of, of foreign, uh, foreign reserves that uh, foreign, this would be the, the optimality condition I showed you before. And this is the one where you are uh, now realizing that if you were to have more, more assets at time t, then you would depreciate less the exchange rate. Okay? Why? Well, remember, you're having this policy menu that is, is, uh, is away from the efficient allocation. So if you depreciate more, well, you're going to help to increase employment, but that's going to be costly. And so the more assets the government has, the lower the need to uh, depreciate the currency and the lower those costs. So really, these these two are uh, these two effects, these two views, are are really uh, uh, you know two sides of the same coin. If you if you decide to uh, save more for the country as a whole, then that's going to give you more resources. You can spend those in a recession. That has this positive demand effect. And at the same time, if you have more more reserves, or more or less debt that's going to reduce the need to depreciate the currency. 
and it's going to help reduce those, the, those exchange rate costs. So those are, are effectively the same because the planner is, 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 is going to be uh, optimizing and it's going to be equating those, uh, those two terms. Now, how do we do this then? Um, formally, well, now the idea is that once you introduce foreign currency reserves, this is how the country budget constraint is going to look like. You're going to have the little a, that's the assets that the households choose, and this is the big A, that's the assets that the, that, that the government is, is picking. Okay, so assume that you are in an equilibrium where individual agents basically are only are borrowing, so they are not really accumulating any foreign assets. And suppose now the, the central bank comes in and buys foreign currency assets. So what, what's going to happen then? Well, uh, you know, these households, <laughs> to finance the reserves, you, you need to, the, the central bank is going to have to raise some resources. So think about uh, effectively, the central bank is going to be taxing households, um, raising domestic debt. But in any case, when the central bank buys foreign reserves, given everything else constant, that's going to push consumption to fall. Okay, private consumption now is going to fall. So if a household wants to offset that uh, increasing, uh, decreasing consumption, it's going to have to borrow more from the intermediaries. But now what happens is that as everybody tries to borrow more to offset the foreign reserve accumulation, then the interest rate at which households borrow is going to go up. And that's going to basically discourage households from borrowing and fully offsetting what the central bank is doing. So in other words, what's going on here is that when the central bank raises foreign currency reserves, households are going to borrow more, but not to the same amount. Okay? So overall, you still have that when the central bank buys foreign currency reserves, there's an increase in the net foreign asset position. Uh, and this is, you know, the problem now, it's, uh, it's not, it's not going to deliver the same uh, allocations as, as the tax on, on foreign borrowing, because now when you do this FX intervention, you have these extra losses. Okay? With the capital controls, you could manipulate how much households uh, borrow without imposing any other costs. But now once you do foreign currency reserves, there's, there's, no, uh, there's some cost there because households end up borrowing at a higher interest rate. And that's why capital controls dominate FX interventions uh, in, in a setup uh, like this. Now, of course, you know, uh, capital controls may have other costs from circumvention costs, and when you have those costs, then it, beca it, becomes, uh, it becomes less clear which, are the, which, are, which of the two are, 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 more, are more desirable, but uh, in general, capital controls and, and foreign currency interventions are substitutes when the idea is basically to try to increase the net foreign asset position uh, in the future. Uh, so I'm. Exactly, exactly. Okay, uh, now uh, question that uh, Larry asked, and this goes back to, to the problem of, of, you know, of Lebanon, or you can argue, uh, you know, Iceland, Malaysia, many countries. So now think about a different type of, of capital control, where instead of, you know, taxing or, or, or uh, taxing, taxing foreign borrowing or subsidizing foreign borrowing, we, uh, 
who basically prevent investors from, from repatriating the funds. Okay? That's more of a, an intervention that is going to uh, really uh, violate some of the contracts. So, the, so far, the, the policies that I, I talked about, which are about taxes uh, or subsidies on foreign borrowing, are all respectful of the contractual terms. All they do is basically they, you know, they uh, they, they they put a tax on the new on the new borrowing. But now, suppose instead that what we do is we we basically prevent. Uh, investors from taking out the money. So we had the problem, right, that when, the, when, this, uh, when you have this supply shock of, for, the, for the intermediaries, now you have less capital inflows. So that's a problem. But what if we suddenly say, uh, now all the uh, bonds that are, that are here cannot leave the country, okay? That's, that's a very, you know, uh, a direct way to try to avoid the capital flight. Well, that's going to have some, some benefits here, of course, because as you avoid the, the, this, 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 this capital outflows, you're still able to achieve the, the efficient level of employment and the target exchange rate. Now, of course, this is uh, a... This is a violation of the, of the contractual terms, and so one has to be careful about this because you know, there are reputation costs and, uh, and this can have other, uh, other costs that I'm not, I'm not considering here. But you know, we think that uh, you know, traditionally at IMF, this has been a policy that um, that has not been very, you know, very, very popular, and for good reasons because it's often, you know, abused, and uh, it can it can can end up undermining the, the reputation of the country. But in, in situations where there is a big crisis, a policy of where you you know you prevent capital from flowing out could be really uh, you know part of the. <laughs> Of the, of the policy mix. So I think I'm running out of time. There, there's, as we talk in the paper also about the role of pecuniary externalities when you have the a other type of uh, collateral constraints and, and balance sheet constraints. Uh, uh, Lufu talked about this a little bit yesterday. And since I'm, uh, I think, out of time already, I'm going to to, uh, to conclude, so basically uh, we made, a, I think uh, the literature has made a, a lot of progress in, in thinking about what is the right policy mix for, for emerging markets. Uh, you know, we have now a better understanding about how capital controls, foreign currency reserves can help uh, central banks deal with, with their um, policy trade-offs. There are still many open questions. In the, in the literature, uh, there's need of a better understanding of what are the sources of this fear of floating costs. Uh, here, I, you know, I talked about this capital flight shock that was a, basically a direct shock to these intermediaries, but one could go deeper in terms of uh, understanding where those shocks are coming from. Uh, you know, once you start combining aggregate demand externalities and pecuniary externalities, there are many other uh, interesting uh, implications for policy there. And that's part of what the IPF, the IMF is doing. Uh, there's also more work needed in terms of uh, international, international coordination. Uh, and then there's a lot more work to do empirically, thinking about how effective are these policies, and, and really to build up more quantitative models. Also, one needs to uh, to put in those um, uh, you know better estimates from from the empirical from the empirical literature. So I'll conclude with that. Question. 
don't know. I start. I ask a question. The discussion about the okay, this model works if we can determine exactly what will be the optimal level of capital flows exact. Mm. Huh? Yep. Therefore, if I try to decide, knowing, you know, if there is a crisis, this is the cost. Or therefore, ex ante, I have to decide. Uh, and that, if you want, is the problem of capital control. Which are deciding mm -hmm. in the moment of boom when capital coming in, uh, mm -hmm. what is that I should actually uh, cool down, especially in emerging countries where those are mm -hmm. the good times. The foreign exchange uh, accumulation is that provide a sort of an insurance. In a situation mm -hmm. of uncertainty, you don't know if there is a crisis. You don't know, uh, therefore you smooth and you build up a buffer stock mm -hmm. against, uh, therefore, how much, the, kind of, what is wrong with this thinking, in, in, if you want, uh, relative to this literature. Therefore, if I think in terms of, of uncertainty, yeah. I don't know when the crisis is going to come. And uh, I don't know really if the amount of capital is coming mm -hmm. in is too much mm. or put me at risk or put me on a flight path to, uh, mm. to good time. How do I? Uh, no, that's right. So the, the key idea is that, um, yes, households don't know exactly you know, what the shock is going to be, whether they're going to have financial distress. The government doesn't know either. But the point is that each individual household does not have incentive. Uh, to adjust, right, to, to, to be, maybe increase their, their assets or reduce their debts. And that's why the government is going to come in and, and tell them, hey, uh, now I'm going to tax your foreign borrowing or I, I am going to accumulate the foreign currency assets myself. And in that way, you end up in a situation where if the, this capital flight shock hits, the economy is going to have more resources to be able to deal with the recession. More questions? Yeah. Nice, nice presentation. This is a meta question that I always have on uh, the literature, the, the integrated policy framework. Mm -hmm. My sense is that in general, I mean, it's great to have simple models that allow to build the intuition for effects, but, but I think there is a big bridge to be crossed to go between qualitative and quantitative. My concern is that capital controls in these models are super powerful. You put wedges on interest rates, you just put a tau there, and, and you're done. In practice, you have either capital controls, most capital controls are sat in the weeds, mm. is stuff that matters at the margin in periods of volatility, it is not a one-man style that systematically mm. creates a wedge across all asset classes. And the second category is really financial, you know, segmenting mm. the domestic financial market from the rest of the world, mm. that's China, that's India to some extent. But most capital controls are in the other category, nowhere as powerful as in these, as in these settings. And when you go to the data, unless you go really granular, and I think some mm. people are beginning to do that, if you use like IMF data, I think you don't go very far, because you check on mm. portfolio investment, for instance, Indonesia, you get that they have some controls, maybe because they have some registration requirement of purchases of bonds. Foreign ownership of domestic debt is like 40%, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you get a one for them, and you get a one for China, where you have true segmentation. So you do empirical work on that basis, it's not very important. So I, I wonder what, you know. Oh, I agree. So that, that's part of my, my yeah. last two bullet points, go yeah. precisely on. <laughs> On that, on that direction. Um, at some broad level, I think, you, you, you know, the way I model it here is with the tax on, on borrowing, but, you know, in some work that I've done as well, you can see there is a mapping between taxes on, on foreign borrowing and, for example, capital requirement or reserve requirements on banks. So there is a, there is a mapping there, and the, and the simple idea is that 
you know, th what you want to do is really reduce foreign, you want to reduce foreign borrowing, you want to reduce uh, uh, the imbalances, and you could tax them, and then households would react by doing that, or you could put constraints on banks, how much they can, they can lend, and those can have the, basically the same, the same effects. Tax is like the yeah. The mapping is to do with uh, the quantity constraints and the multiple. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. Uh, so uh, I agree. You know, it's, it, <laughs> the institutional setup can be complicated, and that's also, as I said, why I think there's a lot more work to be done. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to make sure I understand it. Do you get, I'm kind of confused. So the restriction is on the net worth of the country as a whole. So in dollar, actually the do net foreign asset position yeah. in dollar of the country. So, um, and of course individuals wouldn't internalize that. But so the, the country as a whole could get together in the form of the, the central bank accumulating tons of dollars. That would hmm. be the thing, right? And that, that, so like Peru has a third of its GDP tied yeah. up at the central bank. Do yeah. They have a third of their uh, a GDP of the dollars at the central bank, and and that would be and 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 that would in effect make every company in Peru look less risky to the uh, these these wherever these people are that are lending the money. That's the idea. Yeah, exactly. You wanna want you want to raise the net foreign asset position consolidated of the entire country of the entire country. What is more tricky is well, when you do foreign currency reserves, is, is the central bank is accumulating. Well, households may undo that by borrowing they more. They could in principle undo that, yeah. And so that is why. You're saying that, let's suppose they don't have any, anything. So and so I, in the model, I'm allowing to undo it, but the problem, the. No, they, if they don't have any reserves, they can't undo it. They, the they, no, they could borrow. They could borrow to undo it. Oh, I see. So I suppose the central bank accumulates. Yeah. 10% of GDP, uh, well, suppose household now borrow 10% more of GDP. Yeah. Then that has absolutely no effects. Yeah. But the reason why that, equi that sort of Ricardian equivalence breaks in the model is because you have the, the, the upwards, well, there's no borrowing constraint, but there's a, borrowing constraint would also do it. But there's also an upward supply of funds. Uh, households here, they don't, they don't have borrowing constraint in foreign, Currency, they can borrow as much as they want, but because there's an upward supply of funds, as households go and borrow more, that will end up raising the interest rate, and that's why they don't completely undo what what the government is doing. Now, the model. Why is it that the households would? Uh, how does? It, what's the mechanism by which the households want to undo? Not want, but end yeah. up undoing. The asset position of the government. Because the central bank needs to finance yes. the accumulation of reserves, and the way to do it, think about it, is taxes. Yes. So as you put the taxes, that reduces the disposable income of the households. And they have to raise taxes. Yeah. They have to raise taxes, right. Okay. And now, why do, they, why do they borrow dollars? And then the household, if you want to keep the same amount of consumption, um, then you need to you need to raise borrowing to to do that. But they'll raise dollar borrowing. They will raise dollar borrowing because they that know that sense. in the in the future the central bank is seeding all the pile of reserves. So eventually this would walk the way through to the households budget constraint. So the fact that now you you're a household, okay, you know the central bank is accumulating the reserves. In the future, I'm going to get some transfers uh, from the central bank, so I'm going to borrow more today. Now, you have, this is where lump sum taxes matter, right? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, you could have uh, some distortionary taxes, but because then the transfers would be costly. Yes, but but here the point is that even if you have lump sum taxes, the transfer is still costly because collectively, when all the households uh, borrow more, this raises. The, the interest rate at which they end up borrowing from the intermediaries. Last, yeah. So they, they magnifies this externality. And it, to, 
I maybe to clarify what they were saying. So the interest rate that the households face the hmm. borrowing does not depend on the central bank's asset directly. Not directly, not directly, but in general equilibrium, it matters because in general equilibrium. And then they said that, like, yes, you guys make the union terms look better. That's a general equilibrium effect. It's not directly in the. So that's how you break the Bakus and Kiruni bonds. Yeah, the way it breaks is with the upward, yeah, with the upward supply of funds. Upward supply of funds that doesn't depend on. If it yeah, no, it doesn't. On net borrowing of the country, ah. right, then uh, it will have no effect. Well, no, the thing is, these are different assets. They, they, I don't see why they would, de why they, why they would depend, right? They, the government is, is buying uh, U.S. Treasury bills, and that is independent, you know, of the of the foreign intermediaries. So that's why. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.